Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, I'm Fran Barry, publisher at Welcome Collection, and my pronouns are she and her. I'm currently talking to you from my living room in South London, wearing a blue top and glasses. We are so thrilled to have Gavin Francis and Louise Welsh in conversation tonight, exploring what it means to be a doctor caring for a society in crisis on the forgotten front lines of a global pandemic. And before I introduce our speakers, some housekeeping first of all. This event is being recorded and will be available to watch again on Welcome Collection's YouTube channel. Your cameras and microphones will be off, but hopefully you can see us, hear us and follow the event. And we've got live speech to text provided by Voicebox. This should be appearing across the bottom of your screen now. You can also access captions via a link shared in the chat box. When you click the link, a new tab should, should um, pop up containing the live captions. The event will be roughly an hour long with Louise and Gavin in conversation for around 30 minutes. After that, Louise and Gavin will respond to your questions and comments. So please do participate and ask questions. For those of you new to Welcome Collection, it's a free museum and library in London that explores health and being human making connections across science, medicine, life and art. Though our building is closed for the time being, you can still find out more about our work online at welcomecollection.org. Alongside our exhibitions, events, stories and library collections, we publish non-fiction books that engage with human experiences of health in close partnership with the indie publisher Profile Books. And we're very proud to count Gavin Francis amongst our authors. I'll leave it to Louise to do a fuller introduction, but Gavin is an award-winning writer and doctor. His latest book, Intensive Care, traces his experiences over the past extraordinary year as a GP serving communities across Edinburgh and the Orkney Islands. Rachel Clark has described it as an astute manifesto for what matters most in life. And you can get £5 off if you buy it through Waterstones online for the next seven days using the code INTENSIVE. And you can find the details in the chat. Uh, Louise Welsh is the author of eight novels, most recently The Plague Times Trilogy, a series of books exploring a contemporary pandemic written long before the arrival of COVID-19. Louise has, now, has received several awards and international fellowships, including a Doctor of Arts from both Edinburgh Napier University and the Open University, and an honorary fellowship from the University of Iowa. A new novel, The Second Cut, will be published in 2022. Louise is Professor of Creative Writing at the University of Glasgow and a Fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. I really hope you all enjoy the event and now I'll hand over to Louise. Thank you so much Fran, thank you for that lovely introduction and I honestly can't wait until we can walk through the doors of the Welcome Collection again. Uh, good evening everybody and welcome. As Fran said I'm Louise Welsh and I'm your facilitator this evening. My pronouns she, her, and for those of you who can't see me, I have short, shortish, dark hair, and I'm wearing a Shetland jumper, brand new, fresh, box fresh today. Uh, and I'm speaking to you from my home in Glasgow, and behind me is a white bookshelf, which is rather too full of books. This is an interactive event, and we would really love to hear from you as we reflect on the subjects raised in Gavin's books, Intensive Care. Uh, there's a live YouTube chat, so you can discuss our conversation through that at any time. You can leave comments, you can ask questions, and you do need to be signed into YouTube to chat there. Uh, you can also ask questions and comment without signing in via Slido. Um, we can't be together in the same room right now, but through the magic of the internet, we can be together here. So why not just give us a shout out right now? Tell us where you are in the world. We'd love to know. Uh, we'd love to know where you're coming from. To help ensure that everybody has a, a good experience tonight, we want to make this a safe place to share and discuss what we hope will be complex ideas. So as you would expect, we expect everyone to take responsibility for their conduct. Uh, we don't want any offensive language, of course, or behaviour. Uh, we don't want to inhibit or make anybody feel bad. So please, this includes language that's racist, ableist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, abusive, uh, religious, or culturally offensive. And of course, if you do share that kind of content, um, you'll be warned and I'm afraid you'll be asked to leave the event. But our welcome collection moderators are here to support us. So if, like me, you're not the best with tech, if you're struggling with the platform, if you've got a question or if you need some support, please just comment in the chat box 
or via Slido and our moderators will get in touch. You will be very pleased to hear that that is the housekeeping uh, done and dusted. The housekeeping is over and now I have the very, very big pleasure of welcoming uh, Dr. Gavin Francis, of introducing Gavin more fully. Gavin has worked across four continents as a surgeon, an emergency physician. Uh, he's worked as a medical officer with the British Antarctic Survey. And laterally, he is working as a GP, as a general pr practitioner. And he's described the pandemic response of 2020 as the most intense period of his 20 year career in medicine. Gavin, as many of you will know, is a, a well-published author. Um, he's the author of the Sunday Times bestseller, Adventures in Human Being, uh, which is a BMA Book of the Year and Shapeshifters. His books have won many, many awards, including the SMIT Scottish Book of the Year Award, the Saltire Award for Nonfiction, and he's also been shortlisted for the Undachi and the Costa Prizes. He writes for many publications, including The Guardian, the Times, the London Review of Books, Granta. <laughs> uh, Gavin lives in Edinburgh, where he's coming to us uh, from right now. Gavin, welcome. Uh, that was a very long introduction, but actually I could have gone on much further because this really is, this is an amazing book and it's characterised, I don't know, it's characterised by, well, you know so much, but it's also characterised by empathy and yet objectivity you've got this clear sightedness um there's a moment when i was reading this book when i started it and you just mention a date it's not a particularly significant date i think it's you mentioned the 7th of march and i suddenly realized what i knew all along that this is a book about things that have happened less than a year ago it's a book really about now and it's anyone that works in publishing knows it's an extraordinary feat to write produce and distribute a book, let alone in a pandemic. But uh, to produce this book with this level of knowledge um, and the the distance, you're, you're both close and looking at it from a distance. Um, I guess the question is a really silly one. How did you manage to do that? How did you start this book and what was your process? Okay. Well, thanks, Louise. Thanks for the very generous welcome and introduction uh, yeah I too wish we were in the welcome in Houston just now I've done many events there very gladly and happily before and I wish we were back there now but hopefully not too much longer um, yeah I, I agree with you you know normally Louise there's a couple of years between um, having a book pretty much drafted and it actually coming out and this has been the most extraordinary collaboration really between um, Welcome, um, my editor at Profile, Cecily Gayford, and um, myself just writing very, very quickly on the hoof what was happening. Um, I wrote this book month by month and would send chapters in to Cecily at Profile, and we kind of edited it as we went along. And um, I wanted it to have that kind of um, urgency to it. I wanted it to have that kind of... Um, the feel almost of of journalism, of a hot take on what was happening around me. Um, because we've come so far in this year, haven't we? It's just been an atrocious year all round, but we've learned so much. And, um, and I think the other part of your question about how you actually find the time to do it or how you actually squeeze in the time has been mostly for me to do with the fact that I find writing really therapeutic you know um, you mentioned some other books this is my sixth book now and and uh, and I find writing a book helps me make sense of the world it helps me to process things and and right at the very beginning when I decided I wanted to write about this that was very much one of my principal motivations was that I wanted to make sense of this as I went along and as a and as a writer that's how I do it best um, there's a lovely line somewhere by William Carlos Williams where somebody's asking him how he managed to be a GP, a full-time GP in New Jersey, and also um, a very um, prestigious poet. And uh, and he says, well, you know, the writing never takes as long as you think it's going to. And there's a little bit of truth in there, in that I think sometimes that my best writing is the stuff that's done quickly without too much prevarication, without too much endless meditation and re-editing and re-editing. And, and this book was very much like that. It was 
it was written with that sense of urgency driving it through. Just as you're saying that, I'm thinking about how many fine writers are actually also medical doctors, you know, uh, Conan Doyle, of course, Chekhov. Um, there, there, there is that long tradition, but nevertheless, you've got a demanding practice. Uh, you're carrying out shifts in hospital, clinics for homeless people. You're working in Orkney as well. You're a dad with all of, you know, you've got your, your own your personal life uh, to mm. lead to. Um, when I was reading the, the start of the book, because the start of the book is, uh, I could feel the parallels with my my own life. You know, you you have you go to Burns Night uh, in February, which is something that every most Scottish people do. Sometimes they're big lavish affairs, sometimes they're wee affairs, and and houses. We all celebrate this together. And reading it, I could feel the knowledge, the thing that we didn't know then, uh, like a horror movie. That, that everything is as it should be. The usual stresses and strains. We don't know that towards us is coming this massive uh, disruption, this tragedy Mm -hmm. happening. Um, How do you look back on those moments immediately before? Because we we know now what we didn't know then. Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of there's a lot of people um, have been using their retrospectoscopes, I suppose, this year. A lot of people saying what they would or wouldn't have done differently, particularly so many of my patients that found themselves in employment that was really precarious and vulnerable to the the devastation that this pandemic has caused. There's an awful lot of people I was speaking to in the early months were wishing they'd found a way to look for alternative work. Um, Yeah, when I look back on that, you know, Burns Night, and um, I remember we discussed, I was at a Burns Night with some pals in a new town in Edinburgh, and we discussed the, um, the virus in China, the news coming out of China. We... We wondered briefly how much impact it would have on us. But, you know, my mind was very much on the SARS-1 of 2002, 2003, which um, was stopped fairly quickly, really. I mean, it tragically killed about 800, 900 people, but it was stopped and it didn't spread much further. Then early February, I flew out to do a, um, to take part in a, a panel discussion in at the New York Academy of Sciences. And again, you know, there was a, there was a China travel ban in place for the United States at the time. Um, and and I kept getting all these threatening emails um, from the airline telling me that I wouldn't be allowed to go into the United States if I'd been anywhere near China. But we now know that at that time it was largely a European strain of the virus that was circulating in New York um, and that was brought into New York from Europe. Um, so, yeah, I wish I could go back and, and warn people then, you know, what, what we know now. But, but everybody must have stories like that. Everybody must. Yeah, I wonder, it'd be lovely uh, if we could just hear a, a little bit of the book so people can hear the, the voice of, of the book. If, would that be OK? Sure. Yeah, yeah, I could read you just a, um, just a paragraph or two from the very beginning. I'm sure people don't want to sit listening to me reading this all night and get back to the chat. Um, OK, just this from the beginning. This story begins on 31st of December 2019, when the Chinese authorities alerted the WHO to a new and dangerous strain of viral pneumonia that had arisen in Wuhan. The virus didn't yet have a name, though it had already been circulating for some months. And as the world turned into a new year, midnight fireworks igniting in a band across the globe, the virus began its worldwide spread. The story of 2020 is the story of this virus, its transmission, its ramifications for global and local economies, how we travel, how we deliver healthcare, how we plan for the even more damaging epidemics that will come. My ambition has been to chart the evolution of this modern epidemic as I saw it, as a GP and as a member of the communities I work with and for. In fact, the story that I'm telling has proven more complex and its ramifications more extended than I anticipated in the early weeks of the crisis. Back then, my fear was of a deluge of infections and deaths caused by the virus. I didn't see that this would become not just an account of a pandemic infection, but of the sudden warping of an entire way of life, of all those lives which have been thrown out of kilter and whose trajectories were now so uncertain, and the care those people would need as as a result. I didn't foresee how much the profession that I love would be bruised, transformed and reshaped to cope with the impact of the virus. This book is a contemporary history, an eyewitness account of the most intense months I've known in my 20-year career, 
a hot take on the pandemic that speaks of the tragic consequences of the measures taken against the virus as much as it tells stories of the virus itself. You seem uh, perfectly placed to write this book. So it must have been a difficult book to write, but you work with uh, so many different communities. You're, you work in Edinburgh, but you also have work in, uh, regularly in one of the smaller or Orkney Islands. Um, you work with homeless community, uh, you work in hospitals. Um, I wondered if you would like to say something about working in the in the Orkney Islands uh, mm. or the islands of Orkney and the uh, the response in the Highlands and Islands, um, because I think it's important. You know, we're, we're speaking to people across the world, and many it, places are only remote when you're not there. They're not remote when you are there. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but there need to have particular responses in these uh, these places, don't they? In these communities. Yeah, sure. So um, I work um, part time in my own practice. So I'm a partner in a GP practice in Edinburgh. So I work um, three days a week there, and then I do occasional um, locum shifts, just once or twice a month in the practice that helps homeless people in Edinburgh. And then I do um, weekend shifts in the emergency service that's based in the hospital. But two or three times a year, I go to Orkney and cover one of the islands for a week. And um, yeah, the situation there is is very different. The, the medical system is fantastic. It's really well resourced. Um, the, the doctors and nurses that I work with in the aisles are Fantastic. I mean, I remember years ago when I was training, I was a I was a junior doctor in Fort William, which is a wee town in the Highlands, and um, and I said to my boss, a consultant, um, what kind of what kind of doctor do you need to be to work in in an island? And he said, you don't need to be any special kind of doctor. You just need to be a very good one. <laughs> and, um, and I thought that was really interesting, you know, that, that and it's always stayed with me. And that's been my experience that in Orkney, um, I've always worked with fun, some fantastic clinicians um, because there the, the workload sometimes might be lower than it is in the city. But you have to really, really know exactly what you're doing because the potential is always there for the resources to be overwhelmed. You know, there's a limit to places on the helicopter ambulance, for example, there's a limit for example, to how much oxygen you might have supply in the surgery, there's, there's kind of, you've got to involve the whole, whole community sometimes to arrange a medical evacuation. So all these things put different kinds of pressures on the delivery of healthcare in a small place, really satisfying to work in that environment, but also, yes, yeah, a lot more challenging. If, if your decision of whether to admit somebody is just whether or not to phone an ambulance, that's one thing in the city. But if the decision is to call out the Coast Guard from Shetland to fly down through gale force winds to take your patient to hospital, then you have to think about it that bit more carefully. And in the early days, uh, the, the fear was that these communities might become easily overwhelmed should COVID reach them. Yeah, absolutely. Because... Um, the, the very thing that protects small islands from COVID is this, the same as their vulnerability, you know. So um, just as places in the Far East close down and travel in and out in order to try and protect themselves against the virus, so um, the Hebrides, Orkney, Shetland also closed down. So you couldn't get a ferry or a flight to the Isles in Scotland during the lockdown periods unless you were an essential worker and you had access to COVID testing and so on. And for those reasons, a lot of the islands have, really been, have been really well protected. You know, if, you've been, if you're the kind of person who watches these maps of the UK of where the prevalence of COVID is, it's just the kind of person I am, uh, you'll see that the islands have consistently had among the lowest um, prevalence rates of the whole of the UK. And that's because it's so easy to shut down travel in and out. But that same difficulty of access for the virus means there's a difficulty of access for people to get out if there was to be an outbreak. Yeah. And I, I remember in the, the early days, people saying, please do not come to your second home. Please mm. do not bring a camper van into the Highlands. Please just yeah. everybody stay, stay in your locale if you can. I remember uh, a tweet from the Isle of Barra. It was a tweet, the Isle of Barra saying, the Isle of Barra is closed. <laughs> Nobody's allowed to come. And I thought, yeah, good for them. And yeah. um, they were very protected for many, many months. Yeah. And these places are, are beautiful places and they're places that we want to go to. But we want them to be there. You know, we want the communities to to, to be safe. Um, there was great talk, I remember, at the beginning of uh, 
pan the pandemic of COVID being a leveler, we're all suddenly you know, saying this is a it makes us all much more equal. Nobody can go travel. People, you know, people have to stay at home. And mm. I remember thinking because I had written about uh, a fictional book about a pandemic, and the reason that I chose this form was to to examine uh, social constructs and social uh, institutions because I remember thinking this is not actually a leveler it does not bring everybody to the, the mm. same level and I wonder uh, about the impact that you found on people who are already marginalized people that are experiencing homelessness and drug problems low incomes mm -hmm. abuse you know isolation mental health difficulties all the things that society uh makes up you know as well as as well as a great deal of privilege um well yeah it was very mixed uh, louise as you'd expect you know for some people i remember in the early weeks when the first lockdown came in it was for example just taxi drivers like quite a few of my patients are taxi drivers now taxi drivers pay huge fees to hire their vehicles suddenly there was nobody on the streets they were obliged to keep hiring their vehicle yet they suddenly had no income and um there's so many people across our society that work to those kind of zero hours contracts that, that were impacted um, on the early months of the pandemic because it took ages for the for the, the rescue, the economic rescue measures to start to filter through. Um, so that's one aspect that people who are already living with precarity in terms of their income, um, who maybe are not in very good housing, um, they're certainly not going to, they're certainly going to struggle with having the space to and the the uh, digital tech to switch their kids to homeschooling the way that better off people were so that was one aspect um there was also a surge in homelessness because people um i remember chatting to one of the um charity workers in edinburgh who who um was helping set up um the the homelessness response and he said what we're seeing now the new people were coming through are not the usual homeless population. There are people who've never been homeless in their lives, who are coming from um, domestic abuse, who are coming from um, family friction. And ordinarily, they would go and stay with a relative or they'd go and stay in a and b But because all those things are closed and they're not allowed to travel, they're actually falling, they're going on, onto the streets. Um, so on one point of view, people living at that kind of marginalised existence were very much more at risk. But there were definitely some silver linings in that um, one of the, the um, great success stories of um, the early months of the pandemic that I write about in the book with the permission of the uh, charities involved is, is the phenomenal um, pulling together that saw all the rough sleepers in Edinburgh housed within the space of a couple of days. And that's thanks to the work of um, charities like Streetwork, Bethany Trust, the Cyrenians, who know their clientele very well and also due to the fact, you know, Scottish Government and the Edinburgh Council came up with funding mechanisms and so on to actually um, bring everybody in off the streets into hotels, which were all empty because there was no tourists. And it was magnificent, actually, to see what a boon that was, because at a time when we were all being told that the best protection against the virus is your own front door, um, there was all these people who didn't have a front door. And then suddenly they were offered one. And that meant all these kinds of things were able to happen, like vaccination programs for this very fluid population who it's normally very difficult to, to get into any kind of normal vaccination program. Um, people who had very chaotic drug habits were able to get stabilised on methadone. People were able to get registered and see benefits advisors, immigration lawyers, um, all the kind of things that are normally very, very difficult. When they had a hotel room number to go to, suddenly all that sort of stuff became possible. And so that was really heartening to see as one of the, the few good things I could say that's come out of this pandemic. So when the political will is there, the solution can be found. I mean, it's kind of depressing in a way how simple it proved in the end. You know, we've been talking about how to solve homelessness for years, decades, centuries, millennia. <laughs> And then came up with some money, some funding, recognised that this is a public good, not just for the individuals involved, but also for the whole of our society. And it happened. Those of us that were lucky enough to be able to continue working in whatever form, often online as we are now, we've had to make big adjustments. Uh, but the adjustments in the healthcare system have been enormous as well. And I wondered if you could tell us something about the adjustments that 
general practitioners have had to make because it's it's huge, isn't it? You're used to normally you do a lot of uh, home visits and different types of out of hours work. So mm. how has it changed practically? Um, well, yeah, I mean, a normal early on in the book, I, I take the reader um, through a normal day in general practice or normal morning and and try to give a f- sense of how many patients we see, you know, 12 to 15 patients face to face in the morning and then the correspondence that we go through and the phone calls we do and then we go out on home visits. And, you know, it's normal for a GP, a full time GP to see between 25 and 30 patients face to face every day. And then suddenly we realised that wasn't going to be safe because we had this virus out there. We had no access to testing because the only people who could get tested were people who had been in East Asia or Lombardy. And so we knew the virus was out there, um, that anybody with a fever, cough, change in their smell might have it, but we had really a limited supply of testing. And so we had to dramatically reduce the access of people to the practice both in order to protect our staff, but also to protect other people with other vulnerable health conditions that needed to keep coming to the practice. So we we suddenly had to slash the number of appointments face to face. We had to test everything over the phone and decide who really needed some of the few precious face to face appointments. Um, we also, you know, the NHS is always getting laughed at. You know, in the NHS, we still use pagers. We still use fax machines, you know. Uh, Tech is very 1980s in the NHS, and yet within a few days, we had this video conferencing software rolled out, which was brilliant. You know, we still use it a lot now. Uh, it tends to work better with younger patients um, than older ones, but but that all came in again within a few days, and we started trying to do the vast majority of our work at a distance. And that meant sometimes some really odd um corners had to be cut and also it made for some very stilted face-to-face conversations because suddenly at the same time we were told when we do have to see someone face-to-face we have to have this visor, mask, two pairs of gloves, aprons, we're wearing scrubs instead of our usual kind of just shirt and trousers and and um, and I found that extraordinarily difficult to come to terms with. You know, You know, in our GP training we're told, we're taught so much of being a GP is about nonverbal communication. Um, you know, to pass our exam, we have to submit a video of ourselves consulting so that the examiners can see that we're attentive to body language, to eye contact, all those kinds of things. And then that was all stripped away. The rug was pulled away and we were just dealing with, you know, peering at people over a mask and uh, chatting to them on the phone from outside their front door until the last minute of, of nipping in to... To, with a stethoscope or to check somebody's oxygen levels, and that was it. So yeah, big adjustments. Yeah, some of the there's some very uh, moving points in the book when you do meet face to face with patients, sometimes in their own home, who are experiencing uh, COVID symptoms and difficulties, uh, and I find them very moving. And I, I just wish that you were my GP. Gavin, because you, because I think even despite the PP and everything, you can tell that you're, you're reading the people and responding to them and and thinking about them. Um, these changes, are there moves to? Uh, because I, I imagine that having GPs on the telephone, having GPs in offices, uh, are there any moves to try and keep that? You know, post COVID, is there any of this that will remain? And should we be worried? about uh, any moves to do so? Yeah, well, I think so. I think so. And there's a spectrum of opinion about this in my profession. I mean, I feel very much attached to the former, the, the older model of doing things. You know, I like it that patients can book directly in to have an appointment with me without having to sort of run a gauntlet of questions about what it is that they're coming for. At the moment, we have to do that. We have to, because we have to restrict the face-to-face to an absolute minimum. Um, but once we're through the other side of this, whether that's next year, two years, five years, um, once we're through the other side, I would very much like to be able to go back to that. But there's no doubt um, that for practices that were getting overwhelmed um, before the pandemic, this new way of triaging has helped them cope. You know, being able to to figure out that urgency of who needed to be seen face to face by phoning everybody first has really helped them. 
So I imagine that we're going to see a lot more of that afterwards. It'll just it'll be a delight not to have to wear all the PPE. That's going to be the greatest liberation when that finally happens. Um, but even without that, um, I really, really hope that we'll get back to, to something that approximates what we had before. Because, you know, you're quite right. You know, the, all the stuff they, they taught us uh, when training in general practice about the fact that, you know, the patients usually says the most important thing when they've got their hand on the door about to leave, um, that, that people will often try out their GP with a sort of question that doesn't really mean much to them, doesn't matter much to them, just to try and gauge how um, sympathetic they're likely to be. And then they'll judge and decide whether to say what's really bothering them. All that stuff is really hard to get at, at the moment because it's just um, behind barriers of plastic and down the telephone. Yeah, you you write. Um, I think you wrote in your your Guardian article uh, the, about the, the the virus arriving. You know, this liquid liquid hope, as you called it. Mm -hmm. uh, you say there's there's shadow pandemics unfolding beneath this actual pandemic. There's at least two unfolding, and you identify the health conditions that haven't been able to be recognised because of the current circumstances, but also, of course, uh, an explosion of mental health difficulties, anxiety, addiction, insomnia, depression, self-harm, mm. things that have been triggered by the current situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I tried in the book to, to emphasise that, although a lot of my time over the last 12 months has been spent dealing with SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, actually far more of my time has been spent dealing with the horrendous consequences of the lockdowns. So, um, yes, you know, at the moment I hear from the oncologists in Edinburgh that they've got new new cancer diagnosis clinics that are sitting empty because the, the people are not coming forward at the moment with the symptoms that ordinarily would alert their GP to refer them into an urgent clinic to be assessed for whether they might be developing cancer. So um, people have taken the message of the government, which was important, necessary, but they've taken it so much to heart that they shouldn't stress the NHS at this terrible time, that some people are staying home with symptoms that they really shouldn't. And so we're going to see the consequences of that playing out over the next few years. Um, you can see in the grim statistics in terms of excess deaths, you know, excess deaths are up. Non-COVID excess deaths are up too. It's not just the COVID-related ones. Um, but the other, the, the, the second shadow pandemic you mentioned, that of the mental health problems, is what takes up by far the most of my time. You know, like a, a normal GP day, I would spend about a third of my time um, addressing mental health issues in one shape, form, but now it's much more likely to be half, sometimes even more, just because it's not natural, this, you know, it's not natural for us as human beings. We're gregarious uh, social mammals. You know, we need to be able to see one another. We need to be able to touch one another. You need to be able to give people a hug. You need to be able to speak together. But this is a virus that spreads through voice and through touch. And so we've just been forced upon to, into the most unnatural situation um, by it. And I really, I can see that so, so many of my patients are struggling with that. You see that not just in the rise in alcoholism, you see it in the antidepressant prescriptions that we're doing just now. You can see it even actually there's been a rise in new, new um, paranoid psychosis, which the psychiatrists are starting to look at. And you can see why it's not natural for people to spend month after month after month, particularly if they live alone and work from home without seeing other people. And that's doing all kinds of strange things to our mental health and our sense of ourselves, our equilibrium. So, yeah, I was very, very glad to see the vaccine roll out. Yeah, it feels like liquid hope. And the, the, um, the, early, the early data is so encouraging, you know, that even if a vaccine, even if a vaccine doesn't protect you from contracting the virus, even if it doesn't stop you from spreading the virus, it seems to have a massive effect on the need for hospitalization. So um, even, if the even if some of the vaccines don't prove to be 100% effective at protecting you from full stop, they seem to protect you against death, against need for ITU ventilators, all that kind of thing, which is just amazing news. And within a year too. It is amazing, isn't it? And within the book, you talk about a little bit about the history of the uh, vaccination, which we, we probably shouldn't get into too much, but just also the uh, how essential vaccines are, not just 
just this vaccine, but vaccines for other conditions, you know, um, and, and you, 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 you stress that, that uh, people need to get vaccinated and not just for themselves, but for everybody else as well, for the, the good of society. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's something that, I mean, there's a certain kind of libertarian perspective that says that that I shouldn't have to take whatever tiny risk of a vaccine because I'll just take that risk. Sorry, I mean to say I shouldn't be obliged to take a vaccine because I choose to take the risk. But it is a public health question. It's um, um, You might be all right if you contract measles say but you could spread it to another to a child who then gets brain damage and and people don't like to have it spelled out that way to them of course because that's infringing on their liberty which it is but i really believe that we framed vaccination the wrong way we framed it as a kind of personal medical intervention when actually it's far more like paying for a fire service you know it's far more like paying for adequate plumbing you know it's a it's a community thing, vaccination, and if not enough people are doing it, then the whole community will be uh, devastated as a result. And so I prefer to frame it much, I take it out of the medical encounter context and try to put it into the, the context of, of how you safeguard a whole community, which is what it really is all about. Yeah, and that's, and, you know, we, we, don't, we don't want another lockdown after this one. We want this to be the final one, if we can at all help it. Uh, so I've got a, a little window open here and it's telling me that people are watching from London, Amsterdam, Oslo, Cheshire, Newcastle, Midlothian, Buckinghamshire, Glasgow, Bedford, Edinburgh, Devon, and then there's a dot, 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 which I think means and elsewhere. <laughs> I've got some questions that are coming up in the chat and uh, people's names aren't coming up. So excuse me for not saying who the questions are from. But uh, Somebody asks, your work and experiences over the last year must have been, and I wondered this as well, Gavin, they must have been just physically and emotionally overwhelming at times. So how do you continue? How do you carry on in the face of all this? Um, um, well, what other choice have I got? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I've got lots of different coping mechanisms. I guess, but medicine already is a pretty stressful occupation, you know, so um, this has been an added stress, yes, but we've had a lot less of the, our usual work going on this year too. Um, I live about 12 miles away from my clinic and I pedal in and out on my bicycle, that helps me. So I set myself up for the day with uh, some very loud music and uh, pedal along the canal and down the cycle path and that sets me up. Um, I'm only, as I mentioned at the beginning, I work part time, so I'm only working three or four days a week. The other days I'm home with my kids and um, for much of this year with lockdown doing some homeschooling. So that keeps me sane, definitely. And then um, the other thing to mention is um, what we also brought up at the beginning is that I make sense of things through writing and reading. So I do I research things and I, I write notes about them. And then when I get an opportunity, I, I, I sit down and try and craft the most concise and eloquent sentence that I can to express what it is that I think and and that definitely helps me make sense of the world and keeps me on an even keel. And you've written uh, rather beautifully in, at different points pre-pandemic about uh, the search for isolation and then the search for coming together which I, I guess uh, having been on the Antarctic survey and things does that does that help give you some something to draw on? Yeah absolutely yeah yeah, all these uh, pictures behind me are the maps from my book about isolation and connection and um, about about islands and the allure of islands. And, and yeah, there's something in there. Um, I think very much that, that as human beings, we need a bit of isolation. You know, you definitely need it. You know, the famous psychoanalyst Donald Winnicott used to say that, that without adequate opportunity to, to isolate themselves, adolescents could get very mentally unwell. But at the same time, if we get too isolated, then we get what he described as insulated to the world, and, and that's unhealthy too. So we are a gregarious species. We need contact, we need communication, but we also need periods of retreat. And I don't 
I don't want to say that everything has been doom and gloom this year because I have heard some stories that are just great. You know, people who didn't like their commute and hated going into their office have loved this year. You know, some some kids have really flourished with homeschooling. Not the majority, but some of them really have. And so I think all of us are going to emerge from this terrible year with a new idea about what it is that we most value and hopefully a bit more recalibrated to 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 something that will make us happier going forward. Yeah, there are opportunities, I suppose, within the experiences that we have. Um, somebody else is asking, how does the way in which you approach your medical care practice, does that uh, influence how you approach your writing? Is there a synergy there? Um, yeah, I think there is very much, you know, both. Um, well, medicine is very much about words and about uh, communication and it's about it's about human stories and human lives and um, it uses a very different part of my brain but I can tell that there's um, resonances there and harmonies that I benefit from so you know sometimes I'll go through a period where I work really I'm working long hours every day and I get very exhausted but conversely if I don't have any medicine in my life and I've got say a big deadline and I just do nothing but write for a week or two straight without any time in the clinic that exhausts me just as badly and so I find that there, there is something really nice for me about about alternating having a day in the clinic which is all about talk 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 and then a day writing which is all about um arranging my thoughts in silence in my head and I find them very complementary um so, yeah, there's a lot of similarities too. Medicine is mostly about communication and stories. And writing is about trying to, for me, is about trying to articulate an experience in the most kind of elegant and concise way that you can. So, yeah, there's a, there's, there's definite similarities. Yeah, and I, I find uh, I work part time at the Un Glasgow University. It's a similar thing. I want to be amongst my colleagues and students and then I'm very glad to come home <laughs> and sit at my desk quietly. Um, there's a, a, a contributor who's uh, written in and underlined what you said earlier. Uh, they say, as an oncologist, please can I make a plea not to ignore symptoms. Non-surgical cancer treatments have been generally shown to be safe during this past year. And I think that's something uh, that you would concur with. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, somebody else is saying, Gavin, it's really comforting to hear that this isn't natural for us <laughs> uh, because we all feel a bit out of our out of our comfort zone. How do you prioritise patients is another question. How do you make that decision of who to see first? It's been really, really difficult. It's been very difficult because we're not really trained in this. We're trained... I mean, the way I was trained in medicine through the 1990s at medical school and then in my early junior doctor years um, was always the motto is see the patient. You know, did you see the patient? Don't ask me about what to do until you've actually seen, eyeballed the patient, put your hand on their belly, listen to their chest, whatever. And then suddenly we've had to adapt to a whole new way of working, which is much more triage based, where we're just trying to figure out who's got the most worrying symptoms and bringing only them in. So at the beginning, when um, when the first lockdowns happened, we were seeing very few patients because we were trying to figure this out and um, for ourselves. Um, never having been through something like this before, it was a lot of fast learning. Um, I very quickly found that my patients resolved into three principal categories. There was the ones that could have, that had a symptom that could conceivably represent something really worrying, like cancer, you know, so people with new persistent coughs that weren't settling, people passing blood, people, people who were having problems that made me think, I really need to see them and arrange an urgent scan or arrange something quick. Um, the second um, group, where all those uh, joint injections that I do, you know, um, there's just some things you can't do down a phone, like uh, um, inject somebody's uh, frozen shoulder or um, their, their chronic knee arthritis and so on. So I started to see the, the joint injections again and bring them in. And so people like who, to, to relieve pain. Uh, yeah, I would put a needle into the knee or the shoulder to, to relieve their pain. But the third group where um, I started probably from about May, um, was the people with really terrible, ter terribly difficult mental health 
issues who were not coping well um, with this very distance approach. And so we began then to, to start to bring people back into the clinic who were suffering really terribly with their mental health. And the psychiatrists were doing the same. Initially, the psychiatrists were just trying to do everything on the phone or with uh, video calls. And then they began to see patients again face to face as well. So those were, those were the three kind of principal categories. And now I'm starting to see much more um, um, of the kind of routine skin condition stuff that's just impossible for people to take pictures of and send you. You can never figure out what it is on a blurry um, uh, smartphone photograph. So I've started to bring those people in too. So there's a, there's a room in the market for an app that can help you photograph your, your rash yeah, properly. Yeah, exactly. dermatologist <laughs> listening, yeah. Um, there's an interesting uh, uh, question, and please forgive me. I'm going to uh, I'm going to pronounce your your name wrong, probably Canon, but Canon Marcel Marastlegil, and I apologise for not pronouncing your your name well. How do you think we could uh, create more collaborative work between the cultural and health sectors? You you work as a a writer, you also work as a GP, um, and they're acknowledging the the welcome. But they're saying, do you know of any other examples of arts organisations uh, that are working between culture and health? Mm. Um, yeah, and there's there's lots of different um, opportunities, I think, for this. There's a lot of, in Scotland, you know, Creative Scotland fund quite a lot of different projects that are also to do with mental health. There's um, music projects um, for, for people with dementia. There's um, um, thinking of um, ArtLink again here in Edinburgh, which is about art and people with chronic mental health conditions through the Royal Edinburgh Hospital. Um, there's, yeah, there's a whole world of scope out there, I think, and people are very much aware of how important culture and the way, um, you know, the way we make sense of our world is to medicine. Um, so, yeah, I, for me, it doesn't seem like some people see a very hard border between these two things, but for me, it's never felt like there's any border at all. They just move seamlessly from one end to the other. And so um, when I look around, I see a lot of different opportunities for kind of cross-cultural pollination, if you like. Um, I don't see it as being a big issue between two disparate cultures, but I know other parts of the country, maybe it's different. Other kinds of mentalities, it's not, it's, it's different too. And Canon's also saying thanks to people who safeguard our communities, um, which I think we'd all echo as well. Um, there's, an, there's a question from Nathan Dean, and uh, they're saying, as a, a as a medical student, uh, do you have any advice or words for those who are heading into a new pandemic-shaped future of the NHS? Um, well, I would say to all the medical students and nursing students out there that this is all temporary. You know, I think they've all had the most atrocious last year you know I've just we've just heard uh, that the dental students are having to repeat the year because they've not been able to do all the um they've not been able to do the procedures safely that they have to be signed off on before qualifying as dentists I mean hopefully the, the medical students and the nursing students will be able to graduate this year and, and begin work uh, in the summer but um yeah this won't last forever we're we're already seeing the figures improve hugely in terms of the hospitalization uh, numbers. And um, we've learned a lot from this pandemic, definitely. We've, we're gonna be so much better prepared for the next one, I hope. Um, and I hope it's as long as a century again. You know, we had a century from the Spanish flu until this one, let's hope it's more than a century again. Um, yeah, but I think I think my my advice is that the, it's a wonderful job. It's a fantastic profession. The church of it is broad. There's thousands and thousands of different opportunities and places you can go and things you can do with it. And um, this last year and the next year or so are really going to be quite odd and anomalous, but it's also quite an exciting time. I can see a lot of barriers dropping at the moment, a lot of red tape being cut, a lot of people who were quite wedded to uh, hierarchies of prestige are letting those kind of hierarchies fall away and so yeah it's a time of opportunity as well and um and i hope i wish you all the best with it you know it's a great adventure i was attended a very good event with the philosopher uh Humike baba recently and somebody asked him about climate change what should, how should we act under climate change and he said project yourself into the future 
and imagine yourself looking back on now mm. and you might find the answer. And I thought this is a great thing. And I've been trying to do this to live in the moment, but also to look forward to look forward at myself looking back, <laughs> mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Um, yeah. 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 Bit- somebody somebody asked me. Um, Somebody asked me what my 20, 20 year old self would think of me now. I said, I don't care about that. I want to know what my 75 year old self would say about me now. That's what I need the advice about. Yes. I, need, I need somebody in the, I need myself in the future to come back and tell me what I should be up to. At this precise moment. Yeah. Uh, there's a question for Yazine Youssef, who's saying, uh, who says, quite rightly, people from eth- ethnic minority communities, some People are shying away from receiving the COVID vaccine. And do you have any ideas of how people might be encouraged to take up that opportunity of being vaccinated? Um, I think it's just word of mouth. You know, I think people have to see other people they know and trust uh, getting the vaccine, seeing that there's no strange side effects. You know, I've been telling, I occasionally speak to people that are um, slightly vaccine skeptic through my own work. It doesn't happen very often in the community that I work with, but it does sometimes happen. And um, and I just point out, I've had it. I've had the Pfizer vaccine. I've had my booster. I've been absolutely fine. I've given the Oxford vaccine to numerous people. Um, some of my frailest, most elderly, most vulnerable patients. They've all done fantastically well with it. I've not seen any significant adverse reactions. Um, so I think, yeah, if you're if if anybody's particularly interested in in vaccine skepticism there's a wonderful book by the american sociologist jennifer reich called calling the shots a couple of years ago i was asked to review that and um and i just thought it was so beautifully written it was like um it's a very rare thing of an, an academic book which is actually reads so easily for the general reader but but the sociologist very very systematically methodically goes through all the reasons why people might feel vaccine skeptic and shows how they've arisen and then offers counter arguments um, i think um it's a really powerful book so that book's called calling the shots calling the shots yeah vaccine the the, the people who work with vaccines they love a good pun don't they <laughs> <laughs> but that sounds like a really yeah. good recommendation. Um, Zayan Mohammed is asking, uh, how will you or how will we, the NHS, how will the NHS overcome the massive backlog of patients that have had to postpone treatment or appointments for diagnosis due to the, the COVID-19 crisis? Yeah, that is a very difficult question. Um, I'm hoping that um, uh, without getting too political, we're going to get millions and millions of pounds that were promised on the side of a bus. Um, so we're going to need an awful lot of money to do it. And I hope that um, the politicians in charge will come up with that money that we need to do it because people value it. We can see, you know, the NH- people sometimes say the NHS is free. I mean, it's not free. It's ours. We pay for it. We get the NHS that we'll pay for. And so... Um, if that's what we need to do, then we may all have to pay a little bit more or we may need to do a, some sort of redistribution of the pie chart of the public finances. But we will get the NHS we're willing to pay for and that we're willing to vote for. And that's how we're going to clear the backlog. And that's a message to all of us, really, that, you know, as a community, as a society, yeah, absolutely. Have a role to play. It's not a freebie. You know, it's ours. We pay for it. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll we'll get whatever it is that we're willing to pay for. I think it comes back in a way to the the title of this book because when it landed on my doorstep, I assumed that intensive care you meant that part of the hospital where the sickest people are looked after, and it does mean that, but it means more than that, doesn't it? Intensive care is happening uh, throughout the hospital, throughout the community. <laughs> I mean, the word intensive just means stretched to the limit, pulled tight. And if we've been anything this year, it's been stretched to the limit. And, and you know, care is is not just something you do for other people. It's also a kind of attitude. And it's an attitude which, um, as a working clinician, you know, I work with fantastic district nurses, fellow GPs, uh, consultant colleagues in the hospital, all the barriers we've seen, a lot of these come tumbling down this year as people have really tried to pull together and work together to just do whatever's best for the patient. And and um, and it's a real privilege to work in a profession that's all about that. You know, it's, I sometimes, um, sometimes I ha- I'll have an exchange with a patient who's moved to my patch of Edinburgh from, from the opposite corner of the UK, whereby 
I'll need to speak to the doctors that used to look after this patient. So I find myself on the phone to a consultant in Bristol or a GP in London, and they'll drop whatever they're doing, do whatever they can to help me because, you know, they're not going to be paid for it in any way. But everybody all across the NHS just wants to do what's best for their patients. And if that means speaking to some random guy phoning up from Edinburgh in order to share some of your knowledge about somebody's complex medical problems, then people do it. And uh, that's quite rare, actually. In other parts of the world, you wouldn't necessarily find that. So it's something to be really that that kind of uh, caring attitude across the whole organisation is something to be really cherished and valued. And that level of uh, care for society is clear in the book and in people's responses to the vaccine uh, when they were asking for volunteers to test vaccines and to help the, the vaccine along. It was lots of medical people that stepped up wasn't it people that were getting yeah. uh, that were working 12 hour days six days a week and their and their free day they would come in and uh volunteer for trials yeah that's right and volunteer to to, to administer the trials too you know um, one of the chapters in the book talks about um one of the consultants in edinburgh becky sutherland who's an infectious diseases consultant but she took on managing the edinburgh arm of the covid um the oxford covid vaccine study but she she just had to do it in addition to all her usual work i mean she wasn't sort of seconded to do this to to help run a trial with hundreds and hundreds of participants she just had to do it on top of everything else and so i i try to um explain in the book a little bit about that spirit within medicine and also just how many people all across the world not just in the laboratories but in the clinics um have been working over time this last year in order to get us to this place where we have a fully functioning vaccine that's rolling out across the community within less than a year there is there is so much that i would have liked to have asked you about in this book i would like to have asked you about the history of uh plague in Edinburgh which you touch on. I would have liked to have asked you more about the responses to HIV and AIDS, which you talk about in this book. And uh, I think your colleague that you, you mentioned there, she said, I've, 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 uh, I've worked with two pandemics. I want this to be the last. I don't want to work with this. And the, the one that she's talking about, of course, is HIV and AIDS, which had a massive effect in Edinburgh. Um, but we seem to be running out of time. Um, I've got one very quick question because you've mentioned some several books to us and people are asking you for further reading. Once they've read this book, what else would you recommend uh, that they read in terms of uh, medical medical work? Well, well, um, I'm just reading Rachel Clark's book just now. It's fantastic. Um, it's about the first four months of the pandemic from the point of view of she's a palliative care doctor in Oxford. That's um, fantastic. I'm reading a very interesting book just now um, about the effect of money on health in the United States called Broke by Michael Stein. Um, but I don't know. You know, personally, this year, I think we just need to read whatever makes us feel good. Lots of escapist travel literature. That's what I've been going to a lot as well during the, the course of this year. And, um, yeah, yeah. Contact me on Twitter or wherever and we can talk about more uh, good good um, recommendations. And whatever, some people, you both, whatever gets you through the next year. Yes, exactly. And some people may or may not wish to go to uh, Daniel Defoe's History of the Plague, Year, which you reference a lot. Um, Gavin, it's been such a pleasure to discuss this book. And I'm, I feel quite evangelical about it, actually. Um, I feel that everybody would benefit from reading it. Uh, Alan Massey in The Scotsman, I think he said it better than I would. He said, you will learn a lot from it and you will find much more than that is encouraging. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a book that has some very hard moments, um, but it, I felt better for reading it and I feel more hopeful for having read it. Thank you to Gavin. Uh, there's lots of people behind the scenes here. Uh, you met, everybody met Fran, but thank you to Fran. Thank you to the AV people. Thank you to the producers, to the moderators, to the live captioners and to, to Saul, who also organised this event. But thank you, Gavin, not just for being with us tonight, but thanks for this really extraordinary book that I think will help get some people through. So I thoroughly recommend it. And I'm going to say, repeat again what Fran told us at the top, that Waterstones have a, a special deal going. They've got £5 off for the next seven days 
uh, there's a code word that you have to use and the code word is intensive in uh, lowercase. Thank you all very much. Gavin, I hope it's not too long before we get to meet in Glasgow, Edinburgh, or maybe even the Highlands and the Islands. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Back in Aleppo, um, would be nice, yeah. Back in Aleppo, up in Orkney, and Barra, as soon as they let us back, <laughs> as soon as they lower the barricades, as soon as it's safe to do so. But thank you again for a really lovely discussion, and thank you to everybody. We can't see you, but I wonder if around the world, in your offices and in your homes and in your living rooms, if you give a big round of applause. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you to you, Kevin. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Thank you.